a wealth of knowledge in this area and field, and that's why I brought them here tonight to uh, present to you guys. Um, we have many other guests uh, of honor uh, who I'd like to mention real quickly, um, uh, who have come out from different areas, uh, from Wisconsin Emergency Management, DNR, County Highway, Public Health, Public Safety, County Administration, National Weather Service, and many more that I uh, could go on for a while to name. But thank you all for coming out and being supportive of this, uh, this event, uh, wherever you are. As you may have seen when you came in, there's some outreach booths back there uh, with great handout information. Many of you uh, saw those. I highly encourage if you didn't go to those, please, on your way out, um, grab whatever you can. Um, there's great information there from all the presenters and among others with, uh, with helpful information as it relates to tonight's uh, topic. Uh, the session is being recorded. Tonight, uh, will be made available through the Door County Emergency Management Facebook page and uh, eventually the Door County website. The website will be uh, getting a refresh here at the end of the month, and so once that happens, we'll be getting that up uh, for you guys. Um, but uh, if you can't find, if you're not a social media uh, person, uh, you can find it there. Otherwise, follow Door County Emergency Management on Facebook, and, and we'll put it out through there as well. The format for questions tonight is going to follow uh, like this. Uh, everybody, if you did not grab a note card uh, in the front when you came in, there are note cards available. Uh, on that note card, if you could please write your name. Uh, if you know who the question is directed towards of any of the presenters, if you don't, that's okay. Just write you don't know. Um, and then your question, followed by uh, either an email or a phone number. Uh, we're going to use those note cards at the end. We're going to take all of our questions at the end and go that route. And any questions we don't get to by the end of the time, uh, we'll then have those on file, be able to reach back out to you uh, following uh, tonight's presentations. Uh, so finally, why we're here tonight. Uh, in the field of emergency management, we focus on planning for things that we don't normally see every day. Simply put, what brings us here tonight falls into that category, and it reminds us all the fact that several years ago what was once thought unthinkable is now a fact uh, all too real, uh, real threat, and we need to know how to best prepare ourselves. Uh, for those of you who have already been affected, I empathize with you, and for those who have not yet been affected or feel that you will not be affected, please still take advantage of the information provided tonight uh, and give it serious consideration. The goal of tonight is to give you a starting point, a chance to build on a solid foundation of preparedness by giving you the information that you need to make the best decision for you and your family going forward. With that, I think that covers all of the uh, housekeeping. We'll get right into um, the emergency management presentation for tonight, which I will give. I'm going to start off by talking uh, briefly about probably the biggest question that I get in emergency management uh, as it relates to this topic. Um, I'm going to talk about federal aid and state aid, uh, where the money comes from. Uh, I want to be very clear on this topic. There, there's uh, some of this that's going to be geared towards uh, local elected officials and some that's geared towards the public, and I'll make that distinction as we go through. Um, but just be aware that there is a difference in some of this, and I'll go through that with you. We're going to start with public assistance. This is geared towards local elected officials, local municipalities. Um, public assistance is given through FEMA. Um, it requires an event that triggers a presidential disaster declaration. Uh, it's only for publicly owned infrastructure, so things like roads, bridges, buildings, parks, etc. And we need a statewide damage threshold of about 8.7 million in order to be eligible for that for any one event, okay? I'll also state that uh, at this point, uh, coastal erosion and high water levels themselves do not constitute an event. Uh, we need some sort of weather pattern, some sort of something to cause an event um, for that damage to occur. On the state side, uh, the state of Wisconsin is, is somewhat unique in this world, in this realm. Um, they, they saw a gap um, that not many other states have uh, in this public assistance world. Uh, this again is public assistance at the state level, is what you can think of it as. It's called the Wisconsin Disaster Fund. Uh, again, this still requires an event, uh, requires a $3.78 per capita 
So it's a little bit easier to, to attain that threshold than the 8.7 million. Uh, that's for any local municipality, so uh, damage estimates are usually pretty easily attained um, through any event. Um, that will reimburse for things like debris clearance, emergency protective measures, and road and bridge repair only. Again, this is for my um, townships and, and villages and cities and things. Uh, there's a 30% local cost share as it relates to that, and they will only restore to pre-disaster condition. There's no mitigation on top of the restoration. Okay. Another program through Wisconsin uh, DOT, the Disaster Damage Aid Program. Uh, again, this still requires an event. Uh, only applies to locally owned roadways, uh, but there is a 25% cost share and you get 50% mitigation on top of it. So a lot of what my office does is working with local municipal municipalities um, if they do have damages as it relates to an event to see if they can seek out some of this funding. So I'm working through that with several of you probably here tonight uh, and uh, going forward if, if we have events like that, uh, my office is, is responsible for helping you guys help out with that. Uh, but ultimately, it's on, the, it's on the local municipality to reach out to me to do that. This next one is for uh, individual assistance. This is from FEMA. Uh, this is the only money that comes directly from government to the homeowner. Um, again, requires an event that triggers the presidential disaster declaration. Different than public assistance, it doesn't necessarily have to meet that nine million dollar, eight point seven million dollar threshold. Um, but a few key note, few key notes to this: uh, you have to have a primary residence. It has to be your primary residence. No secondary residencies are covered under this program. Uh, won't cover anything that's already covered by insurance. And <clears throat> there's a guideline out there of about five hundred eighty-two homes. I wouldn't stick to that number verbatim, but um, major or destroyed any any one event. Um, in order to even be considered. Um, maximum payout from FEMA is $35,000. The average payout, $5,000, as you can see up there. Um, again, FEMA is gonna, is gonna come in and help you get back on your feet in terms of getting uh, maybe some, some temporary housing or, or hotel, uh, maybe uh, with your uh, hot water heater or your, or your furnace, you get that back up and running. But again, it's not gonna, it's not gonna solve it what insurance can. It's a very important distinction here. Um, just for uh, comparison's sake, Superstorm Sandy in 2012 uh, had an estimated dollar value over a billion dollars. The average payout for that was $8,000 for a health school. So again, that was Superstorm Sandy. Um, and there is no state individual assistance at this time. Again, this is the only federal, this is the only money going directly from government to the homeowner. So, with that, um, I think it's important to talk about my next topic, which is personal preparedness. And, and um, my booth in the back kind of touches this theme. Um, and we're just want to go over a few things as it relates to being personally prepared, um, because I think that's important. Um, in emergency management, we have kind of a, a mantra of three main things. We want to have a plan, we want to make a kit, and we want to be informed. And we're going to go over those things uh, briefly here. Have a plan. You want to know your evacuation routes. If you encounter water in an evacuation route, um, your main evacuation route, um, where are you going to go? I mean, do you have a secondary route available to you? Um, we always preach turn around, don't drown, don't drive through waters. We'll, that'll be preached, I'm sure, again throughout the night. Um, you know, a little bit of water can go a long way when it comes to doing damage and, and, and uh, wrecking havoc. So um, don't drive through waters. There's many reasons for that. Um, but just do yourself a favor. Notify 911. If you do see a road closed that doesn't have any barricades on it, make us aware of it so we can get that road shut down. Um, if you need to uh, evacuate, do you know where you're going to go? Uh, do you have a uh, friend, relative, someone you can go to? Um, don't, don't rely on an emergency shelter um, as your main source. Uh, if that's the only thing you have, that's okay. But uh, again, they don't always, they don't take pets. Most of them don't, anything, especially anything run by the Red Cross. Um, so, if you have somewhere else to go, try to make those arrangements ahead of time. Call those people, say, hey, you know, if I do get flooded out, is it okay if I stay with you for a couple days till I get back on my feet and get things sorted out? Uh, very important to have that plan in place ahead of time. Um, very important as well, and this is kind of common sense for some, but 
if you have a property in your lower levels, move it out of there. It's important to you. You don't want it to get water on it. Uh, get it to higher ground now. Don't wait until uh, water levels get this high. You know, uh, keep important documents in waterproof containers. Keep them out of out of harm's way. Uh, again, just simple tip there to, to um, help mitigate yourself. Know where your electrical gas and electrical and gas shutoff valves are. Uh, if you have to evacuate, you just shut those things off. Prevent further risk to your uh, to your household while you're gone. Uh, important to know where those are and how to turn those off. Uh, it's one of those little things you don't always think of. You don't always think of these things uh, in the moment, and so it's important to get a, a plan ahead of time to get those things taken care of. Uh, my emergency management booth in the back, uh, I have sample uh, kits, uh, kind of guidelines. Don't think of them as a have to, but just kind of guidelines for people to uh, put in an emergency kit. Again, if your roads are washed out, we may not be able to get to you in an emergency situation. Uh, if fire trucks or ambulances can't make it down your road, um, you might be on your own for up to 72 hours. It's the, the federal guideline is, is 72 hours to be able to sustain yourself through food, water, um, warmth, etc. Um, have, have, have some supplies in hand, flashlight if you lose power. Um, try to be self-sustainable for at least a couple of days until we can get you some help. Because help will come, it just the more help you can uh, help us, uh, the more time you can buy us really helps us and with, with that. So, and again, consider infinite pet needs uh, with your kits. You don't always think about uh, purses, pets, pills. Make sure all those things you have areas to uh, replenish those and, and know how you're going to get those in event. Uh, again, paper copies are on my booth in the back if you need those. And again, be informed. <clears throat> you want to know your hazards. Do you live in a floodplain? Talk to uh, land use services here. They uh, find a flood map. Uh, learn if you're in a floodplain or not. If you're not in a floodplain, are you still at risk for other types of flooding? Flash flooding can occur in uh, heavy uh, concrete areas. Uh, cities more more likely, where water just can't seep into the into the ground. So is flash flooding a potential hazard for you? Groundwater flooding. There's a lot of water in the ground. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. The ground is just soaked right now, and any, any amount of rain can cause flooding uh, ponding on surfaces that don't normally get that water, so you could still be at risk for that. Know your terms. The difference between a flood watch and a flood warning, I know the National Weather Service is here tonight. They're, shout out to them. I'm sure they like this, this part of it. The flood watch, stay alert. Uh, flood warning, uh, take this thing seriously. Okay. Uh, uh, same with the tornado. Uh, we preach it all the time. Tornado watch. Keep on your radar, tornado warning, take action now. Same thing with floods. Take those, take those uh, things seriously. Know how to get information. We, we preach redundancy in this, in this area because uh, you can never rely on just one thing to get information. There's too many other ways to get information in today's world. Use, use them. TV might be your main priority, but if you lose power or it's not available to you, know what weather radios are a great option. Yeah, you can run them off of batteries and, and they'll, they'll last for you. You usually get the information before they'll hit the TV even. Uh, weather apps are great and Code Red, I'd like to briefly touch on. <clears throat> Pardon? Pardon? Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. That's my fault. This is for the recording. I'm going to leave these slides up for just a second for people watching the recordings um, that aren't here that can't get disaster kits. This is for them. Uh, to be able to kind of pause the video and, and take notes if they want. Sorry, there's my be informed slide. Everything that we just talked about. Um, and last, I'm going to talk about Code Red. Code Red is the county's mass notification system. Uh, important to note here uh, that you must opt into the system. So you must sign up for the system to receive the alerts. But these alerts can range from anything from evacuation notices to shelter openings, boil water advisories, missing person, emergency police activity, many other things we can use this for. We can hit uh, phone, email, social media all in one shot within a matter of minutes and, and get the information out to people quickly and effectively. So uh, if you're interested in signing up for Code Red, I highly recommend you do at my booth. <clears throat> there are the frequently asked questions. If you have questions about Code Red, what is it, how is it used, where does my information go, Etc. Uh, frequently asked questions sheet at my booth. Please pick one of those up, um, and it'll also be uh, on the website as well, Door County's website. So with that, I'm going to get out of the way and let the real experts uh, talk to you guys tonight. Uh, again, we've got a great lineup. Uh,
for you. If you guys have any questions as it relates to emergency management, what we can do to help, we have to answer those. Um, again, thank you guys for coming out. I really appreciate it. This is a great turnout. And uh, with that, I'm going to let the next presenter come up. So my name is Chris Warren. I'm a senior hydraulic engineer with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers out of Detroit. One of our key missions there is forecasting the water levels of the Great Lakes. So I'm going to give you guys a real quick rundown of the hydrology of the Great Lakes as a system, and then my colleague D. Apps, who is our lead forecaster for Great Lakes water levels, will follow up to talk a little bit about what we've seen and what we expect to see in the next six months. So, I know I just told you I'm an engineer and I put a big block of text up there. I apologize for that. I saw at least one eye roll there. Um, I'm going to cover some real basic information just so everyone's on the same page before we move on. First, when we're talking about water levels, we're talking about an elevation above sea level, not a depth. You know, it's a real common question. Uh, we're, we're talking about how high above really the Atlantic Ocean we're talking. We talk about Michigan Huron at the Corps of Engineers as one lake. So, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are connected at the Straits of Mackinac. As such, they rise and fall as one lake. We can see that with a network of water level gauges we have around all of the lakes. And when we discuss their water levels, we're talking about a daily or a monthly mean or average. So that means it's not influenced by meteorological phenomena, winds, storms, pressure systems, those kind of things are not what we're talking about when we're talking about water levels. All those have immediate and local impacts. That's not what we're discussing. We're talking about lake-wide average. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is the official keeper of Great Lakes water level information, and because they are international water bodies, we coordinate that information with our counterparts in Environment and Climate Change Canada. That coordinated record where we've agreed on the, that data and information stretches back to 1918, and that's, that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about statistics. And finally, I, I will actually read this slide since the, the last piece is really key and critical to what we're going to talk about the rest of tonight. And that is, the primary driver of water level fluctuations are changing weather patterns and the resulting fluctuations in water supply. So th this is a uh, nice graphic that really highlights kind of the Great Lakes as a system. It is a huge interconnected system. We're talking, it's got portions of eight states, two provinces in Canada. You know, thousands of miles of coastline, thousands of square miles of land and water. And because it's a system, you can actually follow, and I'll try to use the pointer here to point out as I talk. You know, water enters Lake Superior, it flows through the St. Mary's River. And that doesn't show up as well as it like, so I'll just I'll talk through it. It flows through the St. Mary's River there on the left into Lake Michigan Huron, as we refer to it, you know, and that's really the northern end of Lake Huron. Then out of that system, out of Lake Huron into Lake St. Clair, through the Detroit River into Lake Erie. From there, it tumbles over Niagara Falls, and then it goes into Lake Ontario and eventually to the Atlantic Ocean by the, via the St. Lawrence River. I'll make a note here that there are two points where outflow from the Great Lakes is regulated. So that's at the Sioux Locks between Lake Superior and Lakes Michigan Huron, and then the outflow of Lake Ontario to the St. Lawrence Seaway. I say regulated. That doesn't mean you control the water levels of the Great Lakes. It means we just have some level of control of the outflow. <coughs> okay, so I, I mentioned changing weather patterns and the changing supply. What does that mean? At the Corps of Engineers, we track a quantity of what we call net basin supply. And it's pretty simple math. It's precipitation plus the runoff from the land minus evaporation. Those are the three big pieces that are a result of those changing weather patterns. You know, hotter, colder, warmer, wetter. And those are what really drive changes in water levels. So what does that mean and how does that, how does that interplay work throughout the course of a normal year? So what we have here is a nice cartoon, you know, you know here in Wisconsin especially, but you know, in the wintertime, that precipitation that falls accumulates as snow in the basin. As winter eventually ends, and sometimes maybe it doesn't quite start, uh, that snow begins to melt and run off into the lake, and a 
along with the spring rains, we wind up getting increased runoff, so that there's that component flowing into the lake. <coughs> Summer comes, we get longer, warmer days, that increased sunshine actually increases the water temperature in the lake, even though it may not feel like it when you go swimming. And that sets up the fall, where you have cool, dry air coming over the warm lake water, and that really accelerates evaporation. What that translates to, and this red line here is actually the month or the yearly average water level of Lake Michigan Huron. So you have a relatively steady or slowly declining period in the wintertime. You have your seasonal rise in the springtime when that melt and rainfall comes in. And then as your runoff slows and your evaporation accelerates in the summer, you wind up with your seasonal decline. So that was a really, really quick tour of Great Lakes hydrology. And my colleague D. Apps is going to come up and talk about what we've seen recently and what is coming up. Okay, so uh, now that Chris went over that hydrology, I'm going to start talking about um, the full period of record. So as Chris mentioned, our, we have um, monthly mean water level data that goes back to 1918. That's when our period of record begins. Currently that data is, uh, is coordinated through 2018. <coughs> uh, 2019 data is still considered provisional. Um, and I know probably from the back of the room or even um, in the front of the room here that some of these numbers on this graphic are going to be are going to be a little hard to see, and, and that's okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk us through this. Um, so as you can see here, um, we have Lake Superior is that top one. Lake Michigan Huron is the second uh, graphic there. Then Lake Saint Clair, Erie, Ontario. And actually, if you stop by the booth, you probably have this on. You have this as one of your handouts um, that you could probably see a little bit better. <coughs> Um, and what I wanted just really to know from this graphic is, as you can see, even, our, in, even in our period of record that goes back to 1918, we've seen periods of high and low water across the Great Lakes, uh, specifically Lake Michigan-Huron. Uh, last really saw significantly uh, high water in the mid-80s, like 86, 87. Um, but then also, in the late 90s, water levels uh, started to decline. And from about the late 90s to uh, January 2013, uh, we really saw a decade plus of low water. That culminated in that January 13 is the record, uh, record low for Lake Michigan Huron. Um, but since then, um, since January 2013, and really we saw a rapid rise uh, over about two years on Lake Superior, Lake Michigan Huron, that really brought water levels from um, low water to back above their long-term average annual level. And that long-term average annual level is that red line that's shown there on the graphic. Um, the, the blue line is your, those monthly mean water levels, as I was talking about. Um, and then annually, we've just seen a steadily rising lake level that has culminated in some of these near to above record highs in 2019. Um, and this next slide kind of goes over the records that we did see in 2019. So Lake Michigan Huron never actually set a monthly mean record in 2019. It came very close uh, in multiple months, um, but it did not actually set a monthly mean record. Now we did see records on the other four lakes. Uh, those records began in May um, of 2019 on Lake Superior, uh, St. Clair, and Erie. In June, Lake Ontario joined the mix uh, and also in July, and then we continue to see records set in <coughs> August and September on Lake Superior, St. Clair, and Erie. The last three months, October through December, we haven't seen uh, any monthly mean records on the Great Lakes, although we have been very close. And even just last month in December, Lake Michigan Huron was within <coughs> one inch of setting or being above uh, records in the month of December. So the next question that we typically get is, well, well why is this happening? Um, and really what we've seen since that, really 2013, but uh, is just a very consistent wet pattern that we've seen in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, what this graphic here is showing you um, is the uh, wettest uh, one year, two year, four year, and five year periods have all been the wettest on record in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, so this is showing you precipitation ranks for the basin, and as I just mentioned, it's just been a very wet period over many years. Um, 
the state of Wisconsin and the state of Michigan both experienced the wettest year on record in 2019, just to, to give you another idea. Um, and then now I'm going to kind of transition to the forecast. What, what, are, what are we seeing um, from, a, from the Climate Prediction Center as far as forecast goes? And actually, this forecast just actually came out today. Um, so this is as of this morning. Um, so I'm just going to kind of walk you through this graphic and kind of what it's showing. So you'll see that there's a one-month outlook that goes across the top there for temperature and precipitation. And then on the bottom is the three-month outlook. So the one-month outlook is now for February, since it just came out today. The three-month outlook is for February, March, April. So it covers a span of three months. So first in the temperature graphic, when you see that blue area, that's indicative of a likelihood of below normal temperatures or colder than normal. The orange areas reference an area where we expect there to be above normal temperatures or warmer than normal. You can see that in, for February, right now, the Climate Prediction Center is forecasting below normal temperatures uh, for the Great Lakes Basin. Um, this precipitation graphic here on the right, the green areas are, are indicating areas where they expect to see uh, above normal precipitation or wetter than normal, and the brown areas are representing an area where they expect to see below normal precipitation. So right now, the Great Lakes Basin for the month of February is in a white area, which means equal chances, which means uh, currently their forecasts are uncertain of whether there will be above or below normal precipitation. Now that changes when you look into the three-month outlook. So now in the three-month outlook, you see that continuation of below normal temperatures over at least the western half of the basin, which includes Wisconsin. And then you see above normal precipitation uh, forecasted for the entire Great Lakes Basin. So looking ahead, uh, in at least the next you know, three months, we're looking at potentially colder than normal temperatures in our region and uh, these wetter conditions to likely continue. So those are, that's the kind of things that we're looking at when we're generating our forecast. And so this is our six month forecast. Uh, we produce a six month forecast at the beginning of each month. Uh, so this is updated monthly. Uh, and currently that goes out six months. Um, I know the people that have handouts probably have a little uh, different version of what this looks like, um, but I wanted to show this one because there's a, this graphic is also available on our webpage, but it's a, it gives you a little bit more information. So I, I'm gonna spend some time walking through, through this one as well. Um, so to start off, you probably can <coughs> see that there's uh, a blue line here um, and that represents the 2019 daily lake-wide average water levels from last year. There's a red line, which is very hard to see because it's over only, it represents 2020 lake-wide daily average water levels, but currently since there's only been, you know, what, half, half the month, or ha half the month, but then just 15 days of the new year have gone by, the line's fairly small. Um, those pink dots that you see are the long-term average monthly mean for each month. And then those black hashes that you see at the top and bottom represent uh, the, uh, the long-term average uh, record highs and, uh, and lows for each month. Um, what I do want to note on here um, is that currently, because we're only coordinated through 2018, as I mentioned, that those hash marks on the top uh, don't uh, reflect the records from 2019 that I mentioned earlier. Um, hopefully by next month we will we have to coordinate that with Environment and Climate Change Canada and we're waiting for the final data to come in so we don't put those on our products until we've officially coordinated. So now let me talk about the forecast, which I'm sure that's what most of you want to know. Um, so on this graphic, this green dot is what we consider our most probable, or if you have that graphic in front of you, the green line, which is your most probable forecast. Um, the red bars that extend from that represent our 90% range. Um, if we're at the top of that range, that means we, you know, the conditions would be wetter than normal. If we're toward the bottom, they would be drier than what we expected. Um, and what you can see um, right away is that so far in 2020, we're starting higher than we started 2019. Um, I'll first talk about Lake Superior here. Uh, Lake Superior is forecasted to tie uh, it's January record high um, this month, and then for the next six months be near uh, record highs throughout that period. 
Um, obviously, if we're, if we're wetter than normal, then it, we have potential to set more records in 2020. Now, Lake Michigan, Huron. Um, so we are starting the, the lake, or this year, excuse me, much above last year. Um, and currently, right now, Lake Michigan, Huron is still in its seasonal decline. Um, it'll, we expect it to decline somewhere February, March. It'll probably decline another couple inches before we start that seasonal rise on Lake Michigan, Huron. Um, Lake Michigan, Huron, however, is forecasted to break records over the next six months. As, as our current forecast, um, we do expect to be above record highs for the next six months. Um, the next graphic here is for the next three lakes, Lake St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario. For the sake of time, um, I'm just going to kind of briefly go over all these at the same time. Um, so Lake St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario also starting 2020 higher than 2019. Again, across all of these lakes, we are expecting water levels to be near records for 2019 or for 2020. Um, so just to keep in mind, it's high water throughout the entire system um, that is, been, is currently being felt. And I think at this point, I will now transition to our emergency management specialist, Crystal Walker. Apparently, I'm much shorter. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Crystal Walker. I'm an emergency management specialist with the Army Corps of Engineers, Detroit District. And I kind of want to synthesize for you guys. So we just talked about our forecast, and then we want to address the next follow-on frequently asked question, how can the Army Corps of Engineers help me? So during this very brief run-through, I'm going to kind of touch on what we have in terms of immediate emergency assistance, and also some of our longer-term capabilities. So when it comes to the Army Corps of Engineers, um, our emergency management authorities fall into two main buckets. So the first one is known as Public Law 8499. So this is kind of the money and the authority that funds our day job. So we have emergency operations centers in all of our districts, and it gives us the authorities to provide support to communities during emergencies. Um, so all of that is Public Law 8499, and all of that is uh, Army Corps of Engineer funding. The second one is known as the Stafford Act. So this is all of our work in concert with FEMA. So whenever you see the Army Corps of Engineers, the big castle blazing on someone's t-shirt out in the field, um, that is typically a Stafford Act event, and those occur under a presidential declaration. So the reason that I want to bring this distinction to you guys is because for the purposes of this event, it is not Stafford Act. Um, as Dan mentioned, this is not currently a presidentially declared disaster. So all of our authorities are really limited to that public law 8499. So public law 8499, as I mentioned, that's kind of our, our authority to go into communities and um, help them with their challenges. <laughs> So the key piece here is that as the federal government, everything that we do is supplemental to what's done at lower levels of government. So we're really looking to cities, counties, and states to really take care of what they can in-house before coming to us for assistance. And because of that requirement in our authority, um, we do have a, a very strict requirement that any uh, request for assistance come directly from the state to the Army Corps. So it's not possible for uh, cities or counties to call us directly and get that uh, assistance. But at any time, we're always in partnership with them. Relationship building and planning is a key part of our, uh, our day job. Um, but we are going to make sure at every step that that line of communication is really in play so that everybody knows what's going on. And so uh, it not only helps us meet our requirements, but it helps your city and county and state emergency managers um, make sure that they're aware of what's going on in their communities so that they can hit their uh, thresholds for assistance. So I'm going to go ahead and address one of our FAQs right out the gate. Um, under emergency response authorities, the Army Corps of Engineers cannot address erosion. It is very clearly outlined in our authority, and it's very much a non-starter for the rest of our um, capabilities. Um, now, I want to point out that it's for emergency response authorities only. We do a lot of programs with erosion, but it's not something that we can provide immediate assistance. 
So what we can do, under Public Law 8499, all of our assistance falls into uh, two main categories. So the first is what's known as technical assistance. So this is a very vague authority, which is great for your communities. It's essentially your city and county's uh, capability to come to us with a, a challenge in your com community, and we can throw um, <coughs> pieces of the vast repertoire of knowledge that we have in the Army Corps at it. So uh, do you need experts in flood fighting? Do you need hydraulic engineers? Do you need data? Do you need modeling? Um, anything that we currently have available to us in terms of knowledge and um, people skill sets, we can kind of throw at those problems. So it's, it's really great. It's kind of a, an open book and um, yeah, we highly recommend it. Uh, so one of the key things under technical assistance that we really like to mention is uh, we have dedicated flood fight teams in each of our districts. So these are uh, team members that are specifically trained in active flood fighting techniques. Um, and not only that, but they're trained in how to train flood fighting techniques. So this is someone that we can send into your community to oversee sandbagging operations, to, to teach what proper technique is, and really just bring that knowledge to bear in your community. So currently for this event, um, in the Army Corps of Engineers Detroit District, our Emergency Operations Center is activated to provide support to uh, both Michigan and Wisconsin. There are currently six counties in Wisconsin receiving technical assistance under Public Law 8499. Um, so Door County is one of those. And if you notice, pretty much every one of your neighbors is also on that list as well. In addition to eight counties in Michigan and growing. This is a huge widespread regional event. You guys are not alone. Um, and so we really do have a lot of great lessons learned that we can kind of uh, bring to bear across uh, both of these states. So typical requests under technical assistance um, usually uh, fall under the sandbagging category. Um, so if you stop by our booth, you, you probably grabbed a little bifold uh, pamphlet. Um, those are flood fighting techniques. Um, so a lot of that teaching those in communities and also trying to help communities decide um, what to do with limited resources. If I have a limited number of sandbags or I don't have um, expedient flood fight materials, what else can I do? Where do I need to place things to get the most bang for my buck? So for example, when it comes to sandbagging technique, did you know that the optimal sandbag uh, filling is one half to two thirds? If you overfill, you start to lose your effectiveness, and then if you underfill, you start to lose your effort, essentially. So it also is much easier for your back to lug around half-filled as opposed to fully filled. Or did you know that you don't necessarily have to tie your sandbags? Sometimes it's much more um, expedient and efficient to actually place them without being tied, and there is a proper way to do that. Did you know that most sandbag structures need to be pyramid in shape for optimal uh, integrity, especially in active wave environments? That's gonna get you the, uh, the longest uh, life out of that structure. Again, saving you effort and time. And then finally, um, wrapping those structures in plastic is really going to prolong the life of that structure. So there is a proper way to place flood fight materials and uh, we definitely want you guys to know that so you're not wasting time and effort. So all of these pictures are from this year. Um, we've been, as I mentioned, in a lot of different communities. So in the top left, you can see that we've been in several communities that have seen feet rises in water. This is truly a unique challenge um, for your communities. These are very difficult to flood fight, so that's something that we can bring that knowledge into your community. On a similar note, in the top right, uh, we can oversee sandbagging operations. Um, so crews and trying to plan out your efforts. In the, uh, the bottom left, if your critical, un critical public infrastructure is underwater, what do you do? Some of those are life safety issues if your fire hydrants are no longer usable or your main thoroughfare is no longer passable. So we can help communities with trying to give that access back to those critical uh, public uh, access points. And then finally, the, uh, the bottom right, um, if water is on your roads, as I mentioned, and they become impassable, it's a life safety issue. Now we're in uh, very cold temperatures in winter and uh, ice skating rinks in your neighborhood aren't always where you want them to be. So, um, you know, how do you keep that water off the road? So the second category of assistance we can provide is what's known as direct. 
So that is our ability to provide physical supplies to a community. Um, there's a couple more uh, considerations for this one. It's not as vague as technical assistance. These sandbags can only be used for critical public infrastructure. We cannot provide them directly to private homeowners or commercial interest. They are reimbursable back to the core. So um, anything that's used either needs to be replaced in kind or uh, paid back to us at our reimbursement rate. And finally, they have to be picked up from one of our staging areas. So right now in Detroit District, we have two in Wisconsin, one in uh, Kiwani and one in Appleton. So uh, this is a capability for the communities, um, and we're just making sure that all of your uh, emergency managers are aware that we can uh, provide this assistance as well. So again, bringing uh, the point about erosion forward, I bring this up again because we do have our fingers in a lot of different aspects of erosion as an agency. So for example, if you are putting in place an erosion protection project, we are a regulatory agency that will also require a permit. So I'm not our regulatory expert, I definitely have a point of contact for you, but just be aware that if you are placing something that is something that will need to be taken into consideration. In addition to that, the Army Corps of Engineers, of course we do a lot of construction. You've definitely seen us out building projects um, somewhere in your community. Um, we have a robust catalog of programs that can do that, and several of them specifically address erosion. So I threw this table up here, not so that you uh, make note of all the specifics, but just to let you know that some of these longer term programs, they do have cost shares. Um, they are competed on a national uh, basis. So you do put in a proposal and it may be several years before it's approved and possibly several years beyond that to be funded. So these have much longer timelines, but it will actually result in construction in your community if approved and funded. To highlight one of those, um, one of our capabilities is what's known as a floodplain management services program. So it's essentially a study of the flood issues going on in your community. Um, it is completely funded by the Army Corps of Engineers, um, no cost to the community. But I wanted to, I wanted to draw your attention to this timeline, one to two years if approved and funded. <coughs> On a similar note, Section 205, this is actually a, an authority to get something constructed in your community. It does have a, uh, a cost share, 65 federal, 35 local. Um, it is competed, there's 10 million federal limit. Um, and timeline is two to 10 years if approved and funded. So one thing that we're really doing with your, uh, your community leaders is not only talking about emergency, but also talking about what's next. What applications do you need to get in now? What considerations do you need to be thinking of now? So to summarize basically all of the speakers from the Army Corps, kind of the key takeaways that we have for you today. 2020 will likely see a continued pattern of near and record highs. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is partnered with your uh, emergency management programs. So obviously we're here at the request of Door County. Um, we are <coughs> providing technical assistance to them. We're also in close uh, connection with the Wisconsin Emergency Management. So um, following that hierarchy of communication that we covered, just make sure that you're letting them know what your needs are and so that we can address those under technical assistance or through some of the other capabilities that the county or the state have. Um, make sure that you're following proper permitting procedures, including um, the Army Corps when putting in erosion control structures. And finally, just keep in mind that there are some other capabilities that uh, the Army Corps can bring in terms of erosion protection, but those do have a longer uh, lead time, essentially. They will take many years to get in place, and they are competed on a national scale. So uh, our partners at Wisconsin Sea Grant brought in this uh, guide, Living on the Coast. If you didn't grab one, please do so. It's one of our recommended resources um, to give you, the private homeowner, a lot of great information about how the coastline works, a lot of uh, strategies that you can use. So we just really like to bring this um, to your attention. And then finally, the good stuff, the contact information. So we do have a dedicated high water web page for uh, the Army Corps of Engineers Detroit District. Um, the link is listed here, we'll share it. Um, but you can also reach it by Googling Detroit District High Water or using your recommended search bar. Um, 
If you have any questions about lake levels, essentially what um, uh, Deanna covered today, she has cards uh, at our booth at the front, or you can reach out to John Alice, who is the <laughs> chief of that entire section, and he can get you to the right person. And then finally, any questions for emergency management? I have cards at our booth as well. Um, but as I mentioned, we always recommend that you go to your county first, just to, or your, actually your city first, and then your county just to make sure that they're in the loop on that. And if you have any questions, we absolutely do want to talk to you, so we do have an email listed here. So that was the end of the presentation. So thank you all for coming out. This is a great crowd. Please let us know if you have any questions. citizen as landowners on how to protect yourself against flooding and so today I brought some slides about um, flood insurance and about some flood mitigation options for the landowners <coughs> so as we're seeing across our state um, flood, the costs of flooding are tremendous it, it starts at the federal the state and the local levels I just have some pictures here of um, different flooding events with different costs, the sandbags, um, the destroying of the roads, um, and of people's property and residences. So flood insurance is a way that an owner can protect themselves. I did talk to you some, some of you guys tonight. It was great to hear that a lot of you, some of you have flood insurance. Um, it's, uh, I think, an underutilized option for people, um, and we also can make some connections. If your neighbor has flood insurance, um, may want to talk to them, ask them about their rates and who they get, get that from. Most of the time, you can get it from your local insurance agent, whoever um, writes your homeowner's policies. Um, if they are familiar with the policies, or they, they don't um, typically write flood insurance policies. Uh, I did have some brochures with um, the FEMA website where they have listed companies and agents, and you can also get that from FEMA Direct, um, and there's also private insurance companies that do do that too. So some flood, uh, flood insurance facts that many owners do not know is that you can get flood insurance no matter where you are at. You don't have to be in the floodplain. Um, that is a big misconception. <clears throat> and a lot of misconception is that your homeowner's insurance um, is going to cover you. Homeowner's insurance will not cover flooding. And sometimes people find that um, the hard way. <laughs> and they flood insurance will pay regardless of that uh, federal declaration. So, you, if you have damage today, you can submit a claim and you will get paid out or you will have um, an agent come in and do that claim for you. And as I stated, you can get um, flood insurance through your local agent. So in 2018, this is a picture in Madison uh, and this is urban flooding as um, I think Dan mentioned before, this is not in a floodplain. In the United States, about 20% of the national flood insurance uh, claims are outside of that floodplain area. Um, the, the lines on a map is uh, a prediction, a 1% annual chance that it will be flooded there. It doesn't mean you cannot be flooded outside of that line. And um, we have seen storms across our state that are going past that blue line. So I just wanted to show you this, that this also could be covered with flood insurance, even if you're outside of that floodplain and if there's urban flooding or other types of flooding. So if you are in the blue area, uh, statistically you have a 26% chance of flooding. 
for that 30 year mortgage versus only a 10% versus fire. So we don't hesitate about fire insurance. Um, we, we buy it probably because it's a little cheaper, but we buy it. Um, and unfortunately, not enough people, and again, I believe, do not cover themselves for flood insurance. You can get flood insurance for a single family home, kind of mediums. Um, you also can get it two to four family home businesses, other out structures. Um, if the structure is two walls and a roof, you can get a policy on that one. Um, and how they rate the policies um, will depend where you are at, if you are in the floodplain versus if you're not. If you're not in that floodplain, actually flood insurance is usually a little cheaper. And they will also may look at your first floor, how far you're above or below that floodplain, that 1% chance I mentioned before. Um, the, for the national flood insurance policies, there is a maximum for six single family homes, and those are $250,000. Um, with that being said, you, don't, you can go less than that $250,000, and if you need more, maybe there's a, a private insurance option for you. They also do cover content, that's up to $100,000, and that's your personal content. For businesses, it's uh, $500,000. And I have some more um, references of that 1-800 uh, number. So after the 2018 <laughs> floods in Wisconsin, uh, out in the uh, western part of our state, there was a, a national declaration. Uh, FEMA did come around and did talk to some of our residents. And I just wanted to show you this video of this person from Sparta, Wisconsin. It does take 30 days to go in effect and that's why I put this if you're gonna buy it buy it now we all heard the prediction um, you have 30 days for that policy to go into effect so um, next I'm going to talk about some mitigation options um, and this is really not just now but the long-term mitigation and, and we across our state we see many options some of these I'm going to show you may or may not work for you. I just wanted to throw all these options out. It has shown nationally that if you spend $1 in mitigation, you're going to get a $7 return on it. And that's not just you, but your community as a whole. So um, as I said, I'm going to show you some examples. Again, this may or may not work for you. Some are very dramatic and, and, and we're going to see some actually acquisition demolition, meaning they were just so damaged, and this is by wave action, um, that they could not be saved. Some is demolish and rebuild. So um, maybe they got uh, damaged, but now you're going to rebuild, but then you elevate and bring your, the structure up. Some of them is re relocate. So you actually move the structure out of that floodplain or to a higher level if you have some land um, that may be outside of the floodplain. And some, it may be elevation, just simply bringing the structure up and putting fill around it. 
Um, some of it may be that if you're in a groundwater situation, it may be filling in the crawl space or basement. And as Dan kind of mentioned, um, some very simple, low-cost ways is to um, move your utilities out of that basement area so they don't get damaged. Moving your electric electrical out, elevating it. And a lot of questions we get is funding sources. So there are federal, state, and local funding sources. Um, each community will be different. Um, and so I do have, if you look at that, it says Mitigation Funding Resource Guide. That is specifically for Wisconsin. It was put together again from FEMA after that 2018 flooding. Um, there's all, all of the uh, mitigation for flooding options are in there. Uh, it also could be in the form of loans, uh, low interest loans. None of them, not all of them are grants, and some of them are loans. And a lot of the grants do require that match funding that we heard a little bit um, from the other agencies. We do have a, we have a couple um, areas in our state where they actually relocated the entire downtown. Uh, Soldiers Grove, it, it took them um, about 20, it was 25 years to do it, um, but they basically relocated their entire historic downtown, moved it out of the floodplain, and now it's their park. And then finally, um, we did have uh, Door County um, planning and resources here tonight, services here today about permitting. Please, if you're going to do anything, uh, flood damage repairs or anything on your houses, please see the county and ask if there's permits required for that. And that is for me, all for me. Hello everyone, my name is Adam Beckley. I am uh, the Coastal Engineering Outreach Specialist with Wisconsin Sea Grant. Um, I got this question a couple times because the word grant is in the organization I work for. Uh, we don't have grants for individuals um, to do work on their shoreline. The word Sea Grant, or the, the name Sea Grant refers to a federal state partnership between the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the state of Wisconsin. So I work for the University of Wisconsin system. Um, Sea Grant is, is a partnership that brings research and education on our Great Lakes to, to people in Wisconsin. So I provide outreach and education on coastal engineering, and that's why I'm here to talk today. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about coastal hazards, and then some options to do adaptation and mitigation, and then a little bit about the educational resources you can find in the back table. Um, first off, what are the factors that cause shoreline and, and bluff erosion? And certainly, one we know right now and we heard about is high water levels, and high water levels work in concert with the waves. Uh, water levels can, can raise up how high the waves can hit your, or the coast, and those waves then strike the shoreline, take away material, and that can remove uh, tow erosion of the toe of a bluff, or remove a, you know, even a five foot bank or a, or a shoreline. And so that's something that we're very aware of right now. But there's also a lot of other processes that go on that can also contribute to erosion of the shoreline. First, we, we kind of look at the top, and, and things we may not think about is if we have concentrated surface water runoff going over our banks and bluffs, that can take a, a sizable amount of material away. And you may not see it in just one event, but it takes it over over time, and a big gully washer can really, can really remove a lot of, of, of material. So managing surface water is something to think about. Um, Another thing would be groundwater. So if there is groundwater seeping out of your slope, that can take material away as well. And again, it does it over maybe a shorter or a long period of time, when there's low water levels, when there's high water levels. So these are things to be aware of uh, all the time and, and really kind of trying to tackle the problem holistically rather than um, just, you know, only looking at the, at the water line. There's also, those are all natural processes. They would occur if we're here or not. Um, we can also do things to maybe speed up erosion. It's a lot easier to, to speed up erosion than it is to slow it down. And so what are some things that we can do? Um, 
By putting in shore protection structures, hardening the shoreline, we change the way waves interact with the shore, and that can cause increased erosion at the areas that aren't protected. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, if we modify drainage, we put in our impervious surfaces, like roofs and driveways, that can change how water flows over the surface and worsen those surface water problems. And then if we want to get a nice view of the bay or the lake, we cut down our vegetation, we're removing those things that really help hold the soil. So we can change, again, change our landscape and really speed up those erosional processes. So those are the things to keep in mind as I talk about uh, the next thing, which is what we might do about it. So I like to advocate for a top-down approach when we're looking at the coast. And, and so this shows what may look like a, a tall bluff, but these will still apply to uh, a shorter a shorter coastline, a bank, or even where the beach sort of comes up. So thinking at the top is managing those, those water issues, managing vegetation, and managing where your land use is, where your house is. And we work down the slope and, and still looking at management of water and vegetation. And then if necessary, if those, if those practices aren't enough, then we start thinking about trying to uh, minimize the erosion from the waves. And that's kind of the hardest thing to do. So that's why I say work from the top down. If we really need to start fighting those waves, um, then, then we consider it. So again, this can apply to not just a, a bluff that that cartoon shows. I'll be showing that cartoon because it gives me the most space to draw my cartoons on. But um, don't, don't be put off by seeing a, a high bluff in those cartoons. So first thing um, Michelle talked about, flood insurance. You don't have to move a shovel or anything. You can do it in your, in your living room, in your kitchen. Um, if, if, if flooding is a concern, flood insurance is, is kind of that first adaptation option to, to give you peace of mind and to cover yourself against the effects of floods. Um, I won't go into the points, but the risk is really you know, as, about as high as it's ever been. Um, so flood insurance is a good value proposition right now um, to buy it. And I think this was a topic that came up last night, but erosion is not covered by flood insurance. Um, it's not deemed an event. So um, there's, there's been areas in the, in the state where houses have gone in the lake and, and insurance doesn't cover any of it because it's not deemed uh, a cover, coverable event. So as, as Michelle would say, call your agent and ask if something's covered. That way you know for sure. But most policies will not cover erosion. And I'm done! Uh, so, let's get back. So, I, first, what I was going to talk about, and maybe I'll get to, uh, if everyone can recover from this uh, visual assault, is managing land use. So, where, is the things of, where are the things of value on your property? And a lot of times, that's our houses. And so, uh, this shows something, a concept that it's called geotime. What's the distance from your house to, say, the edge of a bluff or where the water comes up to? How much, in the case of erosion, is that edge moving? How far you have versus how fast it's moving, that gives you a geotime, how long you have until that erosion reaches your house. And so if, you, if you're thinking of building, think about building a lot of geotime into where you put your house. But I'm sure a lot of you who live close to the water already have uh, property um, a house in place. So thinking about how much geotime do I have left? And, and how is that helpful? Well, one thing you can do, as Michelle touched on, is buy yourself more geotime. If you have space on your property, like this this house did, they maybe 20 feet next to a, a stable bluff, and this was in 2007 when we had low water levels. The most economical option there, rather than trying to harden the shoreline and fight erosion, was, I don't know, that's never happened to me before, um, but, let's see if I can, okay, I don't know why that zoomed in, but what they did was they picked up the house and moved it back. They owned, if that picture wasn't mysteriously zoomed in, they moved the house back to where the barn is, basically. And that, they had to form a new foundation, hook up new utilities, but again, it was the most cost-effective way, and, and really probably the most effective way to protect against erosion, because then they had essentially a lifetime to not worry about this coast eroding. They were far enough back, they bought themselves enough geotime. So that's really one of the first things I recommend to people is think about. If you have space, talk to a house mover about you know, what would it cost and what would it take to move my house back. Again, managing, managing runoff is important. So what, what are things you can do at the top of your house? You can collect your roof runoff in a rain barrel. That way you can release it in, a, in slower ways than the rain comes down. 
water your plants and things like that. That helps cut off some, some erosion. Minimizing impervious surfaces using uh, permeable pavers instead of uh, concrete pads. <laughs> Um, if you have groundwater issues, there's ways to maybe intercept that groundwater um, so it doesn't get out and take away material from the slopes, but to maybe intercept it with a, a trench and then pipe it to the lake. And then, um, uh, this was a house that had built their septic mound system right on the edge of the bluff. And that caused a couple different problems because, first off, every time you flush the toilet, you're putting water right into the edge of the bluff, and then there's a bunch of extra weight on the edge of your bluff, making it less stable. So they ended up moving it to the front of the house. Not ideal because they didn't like to look at it in front of their house, but in terms of keeping their house out of the water, that was a good move. So again, thinking about where is water, are you seeing water problems on your property, and how can you, how can you uh, slow that water down? Maintaining and enhancing existing vegetation. So vegetation is valuable for a couple reasons. Um, one, the, the roots hold soil. And, and thinking about turf grass maybe has four inch roots. Uh, you want to look for deep rooted native vegetation that really has much deeper root systems. Those do a better job of holding the soil. And those root systems also pull water out of the ground and get it up into the air as they transpire water and, and start to grow. So one way, if you, if you like having a lawn, uh, to compromise is a no-mow buffer down by the shoreline or down by the edge of your slope. Um, that lets the roots grow deeper. And maybe you put native plants right by the edge of, your, of the water. And um, it helps slow down water. And then as waves crash into the shoreline, or if you have a, a shore protection structure, having that more deep-rooted vegetation helps take care of some of that splash over from the waves hitting. If you still want to see the lake, you can kind of compromise and establish a nice view shed where you have either shorter vegetation or not much vegetation at all, and then you let things grow up alongside. You can still get your nice picturesque view of the water body. Um, if there's trees, maintain them. There's ways to prune them up so that you can get that view shed without clear cutting, getting rid of all those beneficial impacts that your trees have on your property. So again, thinking, starting thinking from the top down, have, thinking about where your house is, and then managing water and vegetation. A lot of those rules apply to the slope. Deep-rooted native vegetation on the slope of, the, of, the, of this uh, bluff or bank going down to the water, again, holds, holds that soil, slows water flowing down. If you have groundwater in a bluff, there's ways that are uh, beyond a French drain that can help get that out. These things called wick drains can help drain out problematic groundwater and then pipe it down to the base of the bluff so that that water is not flowing down the surface and it's not in the bluff, sort of lubricating those soil particles against each other where it can really weaken this, the stability of the <coughs> slope. We do have a slope that's too steep. There are some earth moving methods to sort of get that back to a stable angle. Uh, one, if you have space, is to just cut back that sort of old bluff slope to a more stable angle. A little less space, you can build a series of retaining walls to, to still stabilize that slope, but um, not take up as much space as cutting it all the way back. So again, you want to see a, a nice vegetated slope. Uh, in these times when erosion is happening, sometimes it's hard to get that vegetation to stay because you, you have continual failures, but you kind of want to aspire to a nice, well-vegetated property. And then, if you don't have enough geotime, none of those methods are working, and, and your house, your asset is really at risk, um, and the wave erosion just keeps coming, then you start thinking about shore protection structures. And so the, one of the most common structures throughout the Great Lakes is a revetment, or a, it's called riprap, rock. Um, it's, it's, it's a erosion-resistant material placed directly on the shore to keep waves from taking away the, the dirt. So a revetment that's effective is more than just a pile of rocks on the shoreline. There, the, coming from an engineer, there's, there's a way to think about how that rock can be placed most effectively to really limit the erosion that's happening. And so this diagram uh, has a couple things in it. We'll start talking about what is the materials of the revetment. Well, we see on top here graded layers of stone. They're not all the same size. We have a big armor stone on top that resists being moved by the waves. It's, big enough that, uh, that large waves don't pick it up and throw it around. 
Underneath that, we have smaller stone that does a couple of things. If we just had that large armor stone, the big gaps in between those big rocks. And so every time a wave comes up, we can lose soil in between those big gaps. And then those, those stones can kind of sink down a little bit lower, um, not doing the most effective job that those large stones could. That's why we put in what's known as filter layer of smaller stones. That sort of fills those gaps and keeps that material from coming out in between the big stones. Um, and then some, oftentimes there's a, a filter cloth that's specified too. That's a geosynthetic material that hold, further holds some of that fine material from, from flowing out in between those large rubber stone voids. Other thing that the filter layer does is it gives a nice stable surface for the big armor stones to sit on so they don't settle and move around and destabilize. So another thing is how is that slope, how is all that rock put on the, on the surface? Uh, it has to be done at a stable slope and so this HB um, typically we don't want to go any steeper than two to one. So two feet out for every one foot drop. So two to one is Deep as you want to go, two to one, to three to one, which is a little flatter, is is kind of the sweet spot that you want to look for. Um, anything steeper than that is really hard for those rocks to be stable, especially in those big wave conditions. Uh, the the revetment has to be high enough so that when we get those big storms come through, they don't come over the top and start eroding the backside. So uh, having a crest height, and then thinking about the bottom, we need to have some toe reinforcement so this this revetment doesn't get undermined and scour out by waves and then slide into the lake. So that's sort of the concept of what's in a revetment. Now, everyone put on your glasses like I have and look at a revetment like an engineer, and you see something a little less pretty. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the design considerations for these components. Just so if you're working with an engineer or contractor, these are the things you're going to want to hear discussed so that you can be more confident that you're going to get uh, a product that's going to stand up a little bit better. So, how do they figure out how big that rock has to be? If it's not big enough, and I'm sure more than one of you have experienced this, it's a big storm comes in and it's all displaced or it's gone, um, and everything you've invested is, is sort of not super effective. So how do they size that armor stone? Well, taking in consideration the waves that it's going to see. And so, oftentimes in, in these sorts of situations where we're at the Great Lakes, a 20-foot wave out on Lake Michigan, you don't see that immediately up onto your house. As the waves hit shallower water close to your house, they'll break, and they'll dissipate their energy and get smaller. And so oftentimes, we're called a depth-limited condition. So the waves can only be as big as dictated by the water depth right in front of your house. So oftentimes, these armor stones will be sized based on how deep the water is in front of your house. Also a factor is the slope. The steeper slope of your revetment, the heavier that stone has to be. Ice can, can sort of throw a little bit of a wrench in this and make the designs more conservative because if we have ice riding up on these revetments, it might pick up and pluck the rocks around. So that could be a, a limiting condition. So these are the sorts of things when we're talking about how heavy, how big the stone. Um, questions to ask, what are the wave conditions? Well, how did you, how'd you figure this out? Uh, do you look at the water depth? Um, Again, it's not just a pile of rocks. There's some thought going into a, a long-term and, and sustainable, not sustainable, but a revetment that's going to last against big wave conditions. Another thing to point out, typically it's a two layers of armor stone. If you just have a single layer of that heavy stone, one of those stones gets put out of place, all of a sudden you have a weakness, and it starts to undermine and pull out that smaller stone, um, and it can bring the whole thing down. So a two-layer of that big heavy stone is much more redundant. It allows that stone to sort of move around a little bit but still remain uh, intact. And so when we're thinking about what that rock looks like, angular uh, armor stone is best. That allows those pieces to lock in together, sort of round field stone boulders. That those pieces will slide around a little bit. Think about gravel versus marbles. Um, you want that gravelly type locking in there. <laughs> Also, we don't want big, long, flat pieces. You want them to be no more than three times longer than they are high. Um, if, they're, if they're really long, they can break, they can slide around on each other. So you want something that's a bit more cubic in shape uh, than not. Again, well, the crest elevation then depends on 
what your slope is and how high the waves you're expecting. That'll dictate kind of how high that has to be. Um, sometimes you can't build uh, the crest high enough for the, for the wave conditions and you might see something called a splash apron. That's some smaller rock placed at the top or behind the revetment that when waves hit it, run up, and water splashes over, they can sort of resist erosion from that water splashing over. Again, deep-rooted native vegetation up there too helps take some of, some of that as well. Uh, the filter layer is going to be, the rule of thumb is to weigh about one-tenth of that armor stone so that it's not too big, not too small. If it's too big, the armor stone can't set down really nicely on it. If it's too small, those little rocks might go up between the voids. So again, just a question about, okay, well, how do you figure out how these smaller stones are, are going to be? Roughly one-tenth of the weight of the large stones. And then finally, this shows a little bit different uh, pole protection uh, strategy. This would be a much larger armor stone put in an excavated trench, and that sort of locks in the toe um, and keeps it from... Uh, sliding out and destabilizing. So again, these are these are considerations um, that you, if you're not hearing these sorts of things, um, then maybe you know ask about them if you're if you're getting work done on, on the shoreline. So um, one of the one of the key takeaways, if if the rock is something you could go over and pick up, it's probably not going to be big enough. On the Great Lakes, we're talking hundreds, if not tons in terms of a weight of an armor stone that's going to stand up to our, our biggest storms. So when I say think about, we have to be cautious about using hardening our shorelines. There are some potential impacts of hardening our shorelines. We change the character of our shore when we put a bunch of rock there. It used to be sandy beach or a, or a clay bank, and now it's hard rock. And so when the waves hit that rock, they reflect off of it. And so the, all that wave energy goes back into the lake and makes a, kind of a washing machine um, and can start to scour out and really change how the shoreline looks. And so that's illustrated in this, this photo here. Revetment was installed in around 2007 and five years later, this is low water periods, mind you. About one foot of erosion before that revetment went in on this property next to it. Five years later, 10 feet per year. So you can really see that how that revetment changed the character of the shoreline. So to address that issue, another revetment went in. And then in 2012, and we can see 10, 11 feet per year. So again, we don't want to be sort of uh, putting in, no one wants to put in a revetment and spend all that money just because. But we really got to think carefully about how we're changing the nature of the shoreline to protect your investment. If it's really need to be done, and it really needs to be done, but we need to think and be careful about what we're doing. One way that we can maybe mitigate some of those effects is if you and your neighbors are all experiencing erosion, don't do it piecemeal. Try to work together. That saves on costs of getting someone out there to do the work. It's only one mobilization cost to get all the equipment out there rather than five or six. And then you're not getting edge effects for each individual shore protection that goes in. You can kind of tie it all together Will there still be effects? Certainly, but you're not sort of passing those down in between neighbors and things like that if you work together. Um, this, this shows sort of working together versus an individual approach. Um, so a couple other uh, methods of shore protection that you may hear about or may have um, that I just want to briefly cover is the seawall. Now that's uh, also protects, directly protects the shoreline. It's a vertical structure, concrete or, or steel sheet pile. Um, operates somewhat similar uh, to a revetment, keeps that material from being eroded away. Um, the waves will reflect more off of this vertical seawall than they will a revetment. The waves will run up that slope of a revetment, they smack the seawall, and you know, the water sprays up in the air. Um, so the effects on the near shore environment can be, can be greater with a seawall. Breakwater, this isn't really commonly done for, for a private property owner, but you may hear the term thrown around, maybe, maybe used not in a proper sense of break. Or breakwater really refers to a structure that's offshore, and the concept behind that is the waves will hit it, and then by the time they hit the shore, they become smaller because they've hit the breakwater. Again, not really common for a private property owner, but that's what a breakwater refers to. And groin, not too common up here. This is a little bit different. It's a structure that sticks out into the water, 
And so as waves move sediment around, a groin will trap it. They'll hit the groin and stop and build up a beach. But the downside of that is that sand that's building up on one side is not building up and it's getting eroded on the other side. So again, um, groins are, are again, they, they can provide some protection, but we have to be careful about the consequences. And right now, uh, with the high water, all those beaches that get accreted with groins get inundated and the effectiveness goes down. There's a lot of empty groins that I see around um, where that sand is either underwater or it's been taken away. So, a couple things that are unsuitable shore protection. Concrete rubble with rebar in it is really not uh, what you should aspire to for shore protection for a couple reasons. One, the concrete was probably designed for a sidewalk or a road not to take forces of waves. It's more likely to bust up into smaller pieces. Smaller pieces don't weigh as much and they're much less effective against waves. The other thing is, all that rebar gets rusted and then your beach has rusty metal on it, which nobody really wants and makes the beach much less accessible thinking about what, what will my shoreline look like after the water levels go back down. Poorly interlocked concrete block. This, this is uh, big voids in between these blocks, and they're not stacked. There's really no crest elevation here, so when a storm surge comes in and waves come in, those waves will go right over the top of that block. It's, does, is it providing some protection? Yeah, more than nothing, but it really isn't getting your bang for the buck with putting that all down there. Someone had to put it down there, buy it, put it down there. Um, again, not super effective. Dumping over the slope is not how you're going to get those nice graded layers, not going to get those pieces to interlock, and, and not really establishing anything, um, just kind of covering the slope with rock. Um, is it doing something? Yeah, it's doing something, but it's really not the most effective use of, of the material. On a bluff too, having all that excess material in the middle of it is adding weight and destabilizing your bluff. And then finally, these flat plate-like rubble basically look like a piece of the sidewalk put on the, put on the shoreline. Waves will love to just toss that around. I mean, it's, it's a big surface for them to get under, bust in half, um, not advisable. Shore protection needs to be maintained. So as I, as I mentioned, the edges of a shore pro protection structure can get eroded around the back. Um, Armor stone sometimes will crack and become smaller and less effective against waves. So if you have an existing shore protection structure, you need to be mindful of looking out for these sorts of things. Um, cracks in your armor stone means it's going to be less effective. Um, this is, this is a, a revetment that had taken some damage in a storm um, and sort of started to get unstable. Could be maintained, could be fixed up. If it's not, the next big storm is just going just gonna to tear this apart. And once that happens, once you start to have gaps in your structure, here we see this, this side right here was a maintained revetment. This was let go. It was all built as one system in the 70s and then maintained in some spots and not the other. This was in 2012, and that's what it looks like right now. So again, these are not set it and forget it systems. Waves will move the rock around, and so it's important to get them inspected and maintained so that they are um, offer you protection for the long term. So, in summary, thinking holistically about the shoreline, trying to, trying to address issues not just from the, from the lake, but also from water coming over the top, um, managing water, managing vegetation, and as a last resort if you really need to, shore protection. In the back I have two resources. One is a handout called Resources for Great Lakes Coastal Property Owners. Uh, this has links to a bunch of different resources from uh, aerial photos of the shoreline taken throughout the years to a fact sheet on working with contractors and engineers. You can pick it up. You can also find it online by doing a search resources for Great Lakes Coastal Property Owners. If you do that, then you can just click the links in there to get to the different fact sheets. This was mentioned. Uh, living on the coast, I have plenty of copies back there. This is what are waves, how do they form, how do they affect your property, what can you do about it, and how do you work with someone to get, get it done. So sort of the desk reference of what I just talked about today. So please take that as well. And with that, um, I'm done.
Uh, one request, we're going to jump into the question and answer session now. So those that want to hang around for question and answer, uh, that'll be our last segment of the night. We have about a half an hour left for that. Um, if you have a question, again, if you could write it on that note card. We, if you have a question that hasn't picked up yet, raise your hand. We have people going around with baskets. They can uh, collect those. Uh, if we don't get to your question tonight, uh, we will follow up with you. We have your information on your card. We can follow up with you uh, after the uh, seminar. First question, um, again, the format of tonight, we're just going to go through as many questions as we can get in in the next half hour. If we don't get to your question, um, we have your information on the note card. We'll reach back out to you. Um, first question, how do we get sandbagging assistance? Are we on our own protecting our homes? Um, as far as I can speak to the county side of it, um, we do not have any sort of uh, CERT teams, typically emergency management. Uh, if there was some sort of CERT team, out of Eamon County, similar, uh, has, has a CERT team that's made up of volunteers that can help with that kind of thing. Door County does not have such a team of volunteers that are uh, at the ready to be able to help with sandbagging assistance. Um, sandbags themselves, I think this is another question on here as well. Where can we purchase sandbags? Um, if you need, if you're in need of sandbags, start with your locals. Um, make a request to your local jurisdiction and make that request there. Otherwise, you know, you can always go the commercial route. Um, in Nards Fleet Farm, they have sandbags available for purchase that way. But um, if you need a request from, uh, start with your local government and, and work its way up from there. Um, and that addresses uh, help filling and installing. Again, we have the technical assistance from the Army Corps that we can rely on um, in terms of how to best place them, things like that. We talked about that a little earlier. Uh, so again, as far as filling, um, the county does not have any sort of team uh, readily available to assist with that. Um, but if the request was made, we could certainly look up to state resources if, if, the, uh, if the need was there and, and the state could assist with that. I'm just going to answer the few that I have in front of me here. We weren't sure exactly who these went to, so pardon me, I, I'm just going to kind of read them. Um, During two significant rain events, homes on Memorial Drive experienced sewer backups. Uh, does the city have a plan uh, for the spring to eliminate this issue? Um, engineering and or system capacity. Uh, what advice would you give to anybody affected by this? Uh, is there anybody, I guess, qualified to answer that? I, I don't have a direct answer, anybody that is in earshot. We'll hang on to this. Um, we've got your information on the card, and we'll see if we can find you uh, an answer for that. Um, is the state, county, DNR, Army Corps, Park Department uh, going to be able to allow us uh, to do with debris cleanup, uh, prevent the debris from becoming hazardous uh, to navigating? Is there a plan to address debris cleanup? <coughs> Panel, go over anything with that? Okay. Uh, anybody within earshot that can address that? Okay. Again, we'll follow up with you. If we can find something out, we will do that. Um, uh, is there a way to get the Sturgeon Bay Channel Canal zone declared temporary no wake zone? Uh, protect the shoreline during boating season. Anybody in attendance that can address that question? Yes. Uh, the Sturgeon Bay Canal is a no way zone, and you shouldn't, they're talking about going out into the lake, right? The trouble is, it's very narrow, and a lot of boats will really pick up speed. 
on the way out of there, um, and enforcement is an issue. Of any weight damage that's done to your property, the boat owner that did the damage is responsible for that. But you have to catch them in the act, and you have to prove that they did it. I'm going to try to answer about four Thank questions you. here at once. So, <laughs> this is a very popular question. So, uh, a lot of these questions are referring to about um, how much higher the water will rise, um, how much um, more water we receive, how far off the mean is the water expected to, to rise, what is the predicted water level increase for 2020. So that kind of gives you an idea of some of the questions. So um, as I do want to mention that um, Lake Michigan Huron is still in its seasonal decline, so we do expect it to go down a few more inches over the next couple months. But right now our current forecast only goes through June. So usually Michigan Huron typically hits its peak in July. So then these numbers I'm about to give you, they it could be higher because right now just our six month forecast doesn't cover the whole seasonal rise that could occur. Um, so from about the water level now, by the by June, we expect that would be following our most probable forecast that is it would be about six inches higher than now um, in, in June. Um, so, and again, that's off our most probable forecast. Um, if we, like I said, if those weather conditions occur, that could be higher potentially or lower if we get dry. Um, let's see, I'm just trying to make sure I hit all of the points. So, um, the one of the one is how far off the mean is the water expected to rise so that water level that's forecasted for June um, that that's the our furthest six months is about 33 inches above long term average and about three inches above last year come June. So that gives you an idea of how far from last how much above last year and how much above average at that six months that's for the month of June. I think that kind of covers most of these general questions about water levels, but if you have, if I didn't, then please come see me after. <laughs> so I have one question, not actually emergency management, it's uh, is there permitting for required for abetments, would that be DNR and USACE? So again, I'm emergency management for USACE. Um, but uh, yes, so most work in the near shore or in the water will require a permit. We have a joint permit application with Wisconsin DNR. So if you follow their permitting application, you get two for one. Um, I highly recommend picking up one of our uh, contact information sheets on our booth uh, or at our uh, booth at the entrance. There is a point of contact for St. Paul District Regulatory in the Army Corps of Engineers. And then I would also recommend following up with Wisconsin DNR for their specific permitting process. But the, the answer is most likely there will be a permit required for that revetment and one is required for DNR and USACE. Okay, the first one I have here is will flood insurance cover the cost of repairing and mitigating shoreline erosion? As I said in the beginning, Flood insurance will cover a structure, and a definition of a structure is two walls and a roof. So um, the answer would be no. Um, but if you have a two walls and a roof, a shelter, it would cover it. Um, is damage from uh, ice shoves covered by flood and homeowners insurance? Um, I can't speak for homeowners insurance. Please talk to your agent. Also, um, whatever I tell you, please talk to your agent. Um, flood, um, ice shows are not covered by flooding. Um, there was another question here about um, the wave action. Um, and if the wave action is in the home, would that be covered by flood? Again, talk to your agent. <laughs> Uh, but typically, it, um, if it is a flooding event and a part of the flood, um, it would cover it. But again, talk to your agent. As you saw the the photos I talked or I showed you earlier, those were because of wave action. 
but there was also high water. There was a flooding event during that wave action. Um, basically, uh, the question is, would a flood policy cover or pay out for a loss if the lake is just considered um, a rise, as we we're talking about here, and not a single event? That's uh, actually a little different than um, that what uh, Dan talked about events. Um, if you read in the policy, it does <coughs> specify what a flood event is. And um, one of them is, is that typically water is not there. Um, and that's why we have floodplains along the Great Lakes, um, that still typically water is not there. So again, talk to your agent. If it, it, it should, and we have had people um, claim on that. But again, on lakes and the, where the water was not there, and they can be high for many days and, and many a long time. Um, uh, condominiums, I don't have my slide right now, but if my slide did have, if it was two to four family, um, there is condominium coverage. It's a little different. Um, I'm not going to answer that. I'll probably have to look up those costs again and those coverage limits. Um, and there also, again, the content, and there's also the condominium homeowner um, Association can get a policy separately too. So condominiums are a little different and I will follow up with that one. Okay. Yep, and that's all for me. So I got a couple questions about you know who to contact to do a certain amount of work. So uh, first question I'll cover is what companies near Sturgeon they estimate the cost of moving a home, moving a cabin, anywhere to look it up. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I do know of two sources you might want to go to. One is, I believe it's the Wisconsin Home Movers Association. They, if you look them up, maybe I'm not getting the name right, but you should land on a, on a web search. They have a, a list of their member home movers where you can find someone who belongs to that association uh, who does move homes. Um, and they uh, they travel. The other the other list is the International Structure Movers Association. They're a little bit different. They also have a member <coughs> database, and so there's some overlap. But between those two, those would be my my first uh, thing places to look. Uh, otherwise, the phone book or an internet search uh, may bring up someone else who's not in those associations. Um, then I got, uh, there's a question about appropriate person to assess property and provide best solutions for severe erosion, um, add, adding more rock to the shore. So um, we do have on the handout that I have at the table, the resource for coastal property owners, um, there is a list, we, Wisconsin Senior maintains a list of known engineering and contracting firms that have done work on the Great Lakes. Um, you'll read, you'll still be hit with legalese saying this is not an endorsement, it's not a recommendation, it's just a list of, of firms and contractors that we know of that have done work on the Great Lakes. It's still up to uh, the person, potential client, to do their due diligence, ask for references, uh, maybe ask some of the, the questions about what I was talking about earlier, about how are you sizing the armor stone, things like that. But it is a good starting point to find someone who is capable, potentially capable, I guess I'll say, of doing that sort of work. Um, also, potentially, uh, local local zoning office, uh, sometimes they have folks who have seen a lot of this stuff and can provide some assistance and, and kind of know maybe what projects have worked or not. Um, and even, and even um, the contact with the DNR can maybe have a, a good sense of what they've seen and permitted that's worked and not worked, but um, they won't provide that professional advice. Um, another question about contacting folks, um, sort of saying, how are people expected to invest a, a bunch of money in properties uh, to get riprap when they're paying for it will not stop the erosion? And so that kind of gets back to the point of, um, when I said looking at this like an engineer and how would someone calculate how big a uh, stone has to be to withstand a certain amount of wave force and, and have a conversation about 
what is your acceptable level of risk. Obviously, we can't design to um, the, you know, if uh, we have 100 foot waves on the lake, uh, you know, an asteroid hits the lake or something like that. But um, they can have a conversation about, okay, what's the acceptable level of risk, and, and here's a conservative estimate for how big stone has to be and give good design specifications. Obviously, that's going to start costing a bit more to get that advice, and, and probably the design's going to be more. But that can give you a bit more peace of mind that um, there's a lot of thought that went into the structure that you're paying quite a bit of money for. Um, another question about how do you protect existing failing structure and improve in an environmentally friendly manner? Um, so I did talk about sort of the negative impacts of, of using a revetment. Um, there is an emerging sort of approach to shore protection in the Great Lakes called nature-based shorelines. This has been in the works for a while on the ocean coast, like in the Gulf of Mexico, trying to use natural features like oyster beds, mangroves. Um, unfortunately, in the Great Lakes, we don't have oysters. Um, mangroves don't grow here. So a lot of those practices don't directly translate. Um, so, so it's really an emerging field in the Great Lakes of trying to think about nature-based solutions to help uh, slow down shoreline erosion. Uh, one of nature's best shore protection structures is the big wide beach. Um, and and um, there's beach nourishment projects that can provide protection. In Wisconsin, getting that uh, in, in permitted is, is somewhat of a challenge. Um, even with a, with a stone revetment, making sure that it's not sticking out further into the lake and, than it needs to be. Sometimes they get well over designed to stick out into the lake. Uh, sometimes you can, you can move those structures back as far as possible and still provide some protection. Um, and also it's been shown that with those hard structures, um, they certainly change the characteristics of the near shore, but having good vegetation behind them can actually help uh, improve fish abundance. So certainly changing the nature of the shoreline, but then coming back and saying, well, I want to you know, vegetate the shoreline, not just having turf grass to the shore, that can provide uh, habitat benefits. Um, so there's not a perfect answer to that question, but there are things that you can do to try and mitigate the impacts uh, if, you, if you need uh, to do that shore protection. Um, question similarly related, related, I just had riprap completed. All the beach grass was destroyed and I want to plant the same kind of beach grass, what is it? Um, so, I guess it depends on whether sort of there is a place to plant the beach grass. If the revetment is covering all the available beach sand, then it may not be uh, super likely that it will, it will uptake. American beach grass is something that gets specified a lot. Um, I guess I don't exactly know 100% what grows around here, but that's something when when dune restorations get done, American, American beach grass is often specified. You can you know, find a reputable landscaper that has worked on uh, you know, shoreline restorations, ask those sorts of questions. Um, but that is a caveat with putting in riprap is, um, first off, you're covering that beach area, and then you're creating that higher wave energy as the waves bounce off of that. It's harder for beach sand to resettle. Um, so, if there is still a beach there, that's great. And if the water levels, when they, if and when they go, when they go back down, and maybe you get a beach back, um, then then you can really start doing that in earnest. And again, that'll help hold that sand in place when the waves come back in. So, I love that question because it's thinking, thinking ahead and thinking resiliently. <laughs> Oh, yes, I do have more. Um, so I have a couple more questions here. So this first one I'm going to address here is how would you characterize how climate change is affecting water levels? Um, there are many meteorological variables that affect water levels. There's, we went over a few, precipitation, runoff, evaporation, there's ice cover, there's snowpack, there's snow water equivalent, there's just temperatures in general, surface water temperatures. There's a lot of different variables that impact water levels. So, um, you know, how climate change directly impacts water levels is is uncertain. I mean, right now we've been in a wet pattern where we've seen water levels go from a low water period to high water. Um, so, 
we, we know recently, in the recent years, that, that wet weather is really what's driving what the water levels up, but um, over a long term, um, it's, it's fairly, it's fairly <coughs> uncertain. Um, another question here is that um, it appears like Michigan Huron has the greatest fluctuation of the other, other Great Lakes in regards of number of feet in its range. Why is that since um, all, all, all the other part of this system? Um, so, Lake Michigan Huron, St. Clair, and Erie all have roughly about a five to six foot range in the period of record from 1918 to now. Um, Lake Superior has about um, a three foot range, roughly or so. Um, and largely that is due to, unlike uh, Lake Michigan Huron, Erie, uh, St. Clair, Ontario, where they actually have rivers that are flowing into them. So, you know, obviously Lake Michigan has the St. Mary's River flowing in and it flows out through the St. Clair River. Being that Lake Superior is at the headwater, it is, it's inflows only from the Long Lake and Agoki Diversion. So, um, we, we believe that that's likely the impact of why Lake Superior's range is smaller than the rest. Um, and then I have a couple questions that are regarding how is the outflow managed at the two places. So that's uh, water that's leaving Lake Superior through the St. Mary's River, and then again water that's leaving Lake Ontario through it, through the St. Lawrence River. Um, both of those are regulated through internationally approved regulation plans. They each have their respective plan. Um, the plan for Lake Ontario is run on a weekly basis. The plan for um, the Lake Superior uh, outflow is, excuse me, run on a monthly um, plan. Those are both uh, run through the through their respective international boards of control, which is governed by the International Joint Commission. Um, so while we can we provide some of the work um, and recommendations to the International Joint Commission, that is ultimately their decision on. Um, the final date settings and and have whatnot um, from that 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 regulates that outflow. Um, another one is related to the Chicago diversion. Um, so there is water part out of Lake Michigan. Water is outleted through the Chicago diversion. Um, that is a small amount of water that goes out through the Chicago Diversion, and that has um, been in place by a Supreme Court decree. So um, it's really uh, govern, you know, it's high up in, in the governmental process, and there's really hasn't there hasn't been a change in that since the, I believe the late 1960s. And then I think my last one, oh, that is very very similar to just to increase flow. Uh, through the system, I mean, right now we're just we're at high water, so the flows really throughout the system are very high. It's just the nature of, of where we're at right now. Um, you know, flows have been well above average on some some of the rivers, and even last year we saw some some months where we saw record high outflows through. You know, I don't have the stats in front of me, but through some of the rivers, uh, especially the St. Clair and Detroit River, some of those flows were. Um, or near or close to above records. So um, it's just the nature of the system right now. Okay, well thank you guys. We'll end, uh, we'll end this thing right on time it looks like. So if there's any other questions, the back of your agenda has contact information for all the presenters here tonight. Please utilize that, reach out to them. If you have questions or concerns, visit the booths on your way out if you have anything else you want to grab. Thank you all for coming out today.